Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of uh, gathering together. Thank you for your children whom you have called and chosen to work for you. We thank you for the desires in our hearts to please you and to do your work to make you happy. Lord, we're asking that as we're gathered here, you'll speak directly to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that this work you have given us to do will do it like you want us to do it. Teach us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For this period, I'm considering the subject sanctification, the basis for growth. Looking at the Word of God, you'll discover that the people that Jesus called were men. Men in the sense that they were not childish. All the people that got involved with the ministry of Jesus Christ, whether male or female, were men at heart. They were people that are passed beyond the age or stage of childishness. There were people that followed the Lord because there was a purpose in their hearts. There were people that followed the Lord because they wanted to achieve something very definite in the work of the Lord. And in that sense, and in that way, they were men at heart. Of course, their backgrounds were different. But they had this one thing common among them, that they determined and purposed that they were going to follow the Lord in the way that God himself had appointed. That gave them desire to grow. Now, when we talk about growth, in the sense of which we are talking about it today, it's very, very broad. One is a personal growth, spiritual growth. The people that are becoming more matured in their own Christian lives, in their own relationship with the Lord, that's growth. Two, growth in the sense of shedding off the things that are not important and aiming for the things that are actually very important. Then growth in relationships. Now, there are people that do not grow in their relationships. They're selfish. They think only about themselves. But when we talk about growth, we're talking of growth in relationships. And the basis for growth in relationship is sanctification. The basis for growth in your personal life, spiritual life, is sanctification. When I talk of relationships, I mean, for example, relationship between you and your fellow brothers and sisters. That relationship cannot grow if you are not sanctified. And I'll show you just now. Relationship between husband and wife. You cannot be rightly related and grow in that relationship between husband and wife without sanctification. I'll show you just now. Then in the church, the relationship between members of the church, workers in the church, and leaders, pastors, those who are given oversight over us. Now, the relationship between you and the leaders will not grow if there is no sanctification. Now, love is very essential in relationship between you and your friends who are Christians, between you and the people you are working with in your offices, between you and the people who are leading you in the church, and between you and people in general that have any relationship with you, your in-laws, the people that have any part of your life. Now, without sanctification, there will be no growth. You'll be talking today like you talked five years ago. You will be as selfish today as you were two years ago. You will be as inconsiderate today, self-centered today, self-willed today as you were ten years ago. And you will be childish, immature today as you were many years ago. 
without sanctification, the basis for growth. Not only that. There are ministers that have discovered that in their own lives, God has given them gifts. Now, when God gives gifts, He may give you gifts for various reasons at various stages in your various ministries in life. Because God has different reasons for judging the time that He gives those gifts, but to grow in those gifts that you minister with. The basis of growth in your manifestation of spiritual gifts is sanctification. And to understand that, you only need to look around in this country. The people that years ago, they had gifts of the Spirit. They had large crusades in this country. And they healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils. But instead of growing in that manifestation of the power of God in their lives, they have declined. They've gone back. What they used to see, they cannot see even today. Or perhaps they're still seeing the same thing, but there is no growth. There is no development. Because the basis for growth, they do not understand. And should in case you are forgetting, let me refresh your memory. That before deeper life started, as we have known deeper life Bible church now, you might remember in your own mind, in any of the states you have come from, if I mention Emo State here, would you find it difficult to know that some evangelists, powerful, mighty, effective, rose up years before? Think. If you know anything about Christian work in Emo State, yet do you realize that those people, they're still alive, they're not dead, but they do not manifest the same power in the same intensity, in the same effectiveness as they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Wouldn't you think about Anambra State and just think in your mind now one by one from Onitsha to Enugum to all the places you know in Anambra State, would you find it difficult to find evangelists, preachers, pastors that rose up and God blessed them, blessed their ministries, and they manifested great gifts, but they didn't grow in them. They were the people that were evangelized, and multitudes will come to the Lord, multitudes baptized in water, and mighty things, miraculous things took place, but there is a decline. Suppose I mention River State, and I mention Port Harcourt. And you throw your mind back to the early 70s before Deeper Life ever got to River Stage. Wouldn't you remember there are evangelists that God raised up and they manifested gifts and there were powerful signs and wonders in their ministries. They are not dead yet, but there is a decline. Suppose I mention Cross River. Wouldn't you remember, if you know Cross River very well, and I mentioned Calabar in particular, people that came for open-air crusades and meetings from that stage, established churches, groups, and maybe Bible schools. Wouldn't you be able to remember that, oh yes, I can remember so and so, so and so. Powerful, powerful ministry in the early 70s and late 70s, but don't you see there is a decline? Suppose I mention Bendel Sage. And I go from Agbo to Auchi to Bini, Bini City. And you begin to remember one by one in your own mind the people you heard about late 60s, early 70s that God raised up and they manifested gifts of healing. They had crusades. Wonderful, wonderful crusades. And yet, not like that today. Why? All of those people that you can remember in your mind, from Emo State to Anambra State to River State to Cross River to Bendel State, that you have come from, that's one thing. 
the search, after the gifts were being manifested, after the healings were taking place, when was all those crusades were being held, they said, what is holiness? They believed it before. They were careful before. They were prayerful before. They will wait upon the Lord before. They will deny themselves before. But they changed. And they said, holiness, what's holiness? And they began to joke, play with holiness. They are still alive. But something has gone wrong. And it's the basis for growth. Whatever you have seen in your ministry, you've seen blind eyes open, you've seen the lame walk, you've seen the dead being raised, you've seen deaf ears opening, you've had crusades in your villages, in the cities, everywhere you have gone. Well, if you want to be going forward, going forward, going forward, the only basis for growth is sanctification. Before I go on, think now. All the people of the world, in their own field, they are growing. Our educational standard, there is growth. Today, you see children going to primary school, they speak English like the people that went to secondary school 20 years ago will speak. They are growing. In our agriculture, we are growing. We used to use, you know, the mechanical thing, the whole, the cutlass. But now, there's mechanization. There's growth all over. Look at all the bridges that are being built now. Before the Civil War, you know the type of bridges that we had. After the Civil War, there's been some development and some growth. There's a challenge from the people of the world. They say, we are not standing still. We are growing. Before independence, we couldn't rule ourselves. We didn't rule ourselves. But in politics, there are people that are coming out and they are writing in the papers. They're saying, we have tried this, we have tried that, but now let us move ahead. They are advocating for growth, for change, a better change. Then if you look at the transportation system, many years ago, there were not many taxis in your state. All we had was this type of wooden lorry that people will climb over. And when a woman wants to climb over that lorry, some men will lift her up like this and dump her inside the lorry. You remember? Those of you are not so young. I pity some of you that are very, very young. You say, what is the pastor talking about? You were not born at that time. Now they lift these women up and then they say, put your leg there, put your leg there. And then they climb up and get into the lorry. It took a very long time. And you can smell the fuel all through the journey. Do you remember that? But now things are changing. Almost every state now is having an airport. Almost every state. There's a change. They are growing. Why are they growing? Because they're not satisfied to remain where they were before. Now, in the Christian fold, that's the message for us. Jesus said, the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Don't let them be wiser than we are. We must grow. And I've told you, in your own personal life, the basis for growth is sanctification. In the development of the gifts of the Spirit in your own life, the basis for growth is sanctification. Now, in the church, we talk about church growth. And there are people that are going for seminars all about. And are saying, we want to grow, we want to grow. But do you know that the basis for church growth is sanctification? Well, you say, but our church is growing and we are not stressing sanctification. No, that church is not growing. Listen to me. Your church is spreading, but not growing. You have many people. And if I had chance to come to your congregation, and I preach a simple, straightforward, direct message on salvation, and I tell the people 
that want to get faith to raise up their hands. More than half of the people you have in your congregation, you say you are growing, more than, more than half of them may raise up their hands. There you are, you have not grown. You just collected them from the street to come and add to the attendance. That's not church growth. I mean, real church growth of the people that come into that church getting saved, making restitution, following the Lord, evangelizing, praying, resisting temptation, overcoming persecution, standing for the Lord, consecrated and committed to the Lord. If the church is growing like that, the pastor, the workers have a basis for that growth and its sanctification. So whatever growth we're talking about, if you want to grow personally, in your family relationship, and in your church, and in the manifestation of the power of God in your life, there's only one basis, only one foundation, and that is sanctification. Now when Jesus was to leave his own disciples, he called them together. And from the very beginning that he called them together, after he had withdrawn from the public, from the very beginning of his ministry, he ministered to the public. Let me remind you. He was born in a manger. The very fact that he could accept being born in a manger is an emphasis on sanctification. Unsanctified people hate what is lowly. Unsanctified people, they hate what is dirty. Unsanctified people, they hate being associated with, with places that have no greatness, no, no pomp. But the very fact that Jesus accepted being born in a manger is an emphasis on sanctification. The choice of Virgin Mary is an emphasis on sanctification. That he chose to come through that woman on stage, untouched by the world, by sin, unaffected by all the pollutions of the world, coming through Virgin Mary is an emphasis on holiness, sanctification. And then being born through her, going to the manger and allowing himself, rejected at the inn, being born in that lowly place, a symbol that there was no cell, that he left his own glory and came to that lowly place is because he wanted to emphasize sanctification and to remain with Joseph and Mary. All those 12 years, never argue, never oppose, carry the wood, the son of God, the begotten of the Father, the spotless lamp of God, will carry that wood on his shoulder, take the saw, take the carpenter's tool. That's the revelation of sanctification. And on the, at the age of 12, getting to the temple and talking to those people one by one, and Mary looking for him. Obviously, they didn't give him allowance, pocket money. They didn't give him the lunch that he will eat. They didn't give him all the things that he will need for support. The family load was packed together. The sponge to use, the soap to use, the clothes to change waste. And the lunch that he would have eaten, everything was part of the family load. And they went away three days without seeing him. They thought he'll be with the crowd, but he was at the temple. The very fact that he was not hustling for the things of this world at that age of 12, and remain in that temple in the father's business, settled and remaining there just questioning about the scriptures. What unsanctified man can discuss scriptures alone without food, without clothing, without earthly material, 
and just stay like that, sitting down in one place for three long days. And the mother came and said, son, we've been wanting to see you. We've been seeking for you. What have you done like this? And he said, don't you know I must be by my father's business? What's that? What's the basis of that in his life at the age of 12? What made him to be so consecrated and devoted and committed and said, don't you know, the only thing that is important to me is to be about my father's business and they picked him up and he rose up. Submission to his own earthly parents and he followed them. And for the next 18 years, we never hear his voice. He had the knowledge, but was not eager to go ahead of God and begin to preach. What made him so quiet? What made him so submissive? What made him with all the knowledge he had of the Old Testament, the whole Bible in his head, in his mind, in his heart, knowing God, conversing, talking to God every night, and he could go out at that age of 12 or 13 and begin to work miracles, and he just kept quiet folded his hand, waiting for the time of the appointment of the Father. Why did he wait like that? Sanctification. I can't see an unsanctified man waiting like that if he has gone to seminary, he has knowledge in the head, in the heart, and they don't make him a pastor immediately. He'll bolt out and leave the church and begin to preach and say, I cannot fold my hand like that. I have all the knowledge of the Bible already. What makes him so wait? What makes him submissive? What makes him quiet? What makes him to wait for God's appointed time? Only one thing. Sanctification. And then he came at the age of 13. And he saw John, his junior spiritually. Christ was not created. John was created. Christ did not have an earthly father. John had an earthly father. Christ was the very son of God. John was just a servant of God. Christ was the very lamp of God, slain from the foundation of the world. John was just a foreigner pointing to the lamp of God. John was just a man. Christ was God and man. And yet, Christ, exalted, master of angels, the very son of God, he saw John baptize him. And he went slowly, quietly, humbly, and he said, John, you are baptizing all these people in water. I have come for my water baptism. John became afraid. You come to me. I'm only a servant. I'm only a man. I am not worthy to touch you and baptize you. I have need myself. I feel empty. And I feel that you are the one to come and baptize me before all these people. And Jesus said, no. Let's teach these people lesson of holiness and righteousness. Let it be so. Baptize me in water. I, I as God, as a son of God, I surrender myself to you, man. Baptize me. What's that? Sanctification. Without sanctification, nobody will do that. They'll say, don't you know who I am? Don't you know where I'm coming from? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know that I am so and so? The whole life of Jesus, the whole ministry of Jesus is sanctification. And it came out of that place led by the Spirit of God. And he was in the wilderness 40 days. And he did not eat anything. And at the end of the whole thing, the devil came and said, if you be the Son of God, if you be the Son of God, prove it to me. You know how you prove something to, to people? I'll prove to you that I'm so and so. Prove it to me. And turn these stones to become bread. And Jesus said, 
Man does not live by bread alone. What gave him the victory over the flesh, over the hunger, over the body, over the devil? Only one thing is that sanctification. You remember the first Adam in his own home, Adam, in his own territory, Adam, in his own dominion, Satan came over there through that same bridge, through the apple, through the thing that he was to eat, he fell. But Jesus, in the wilderness, in Satan's own territory, the wilderness was not Jesus' home. The Garden of Eden was Adam's home. But in Satan's own territory, Satan came to Jesus Christ in that wilderness and said, I trickled and I toppled the first Adam. Now you are the last Adam. He turned this to bread and begin to eat. And Jesus said, no. You won't get me to do that. I'd rather die of hunger than to do anything not according to my father's will. What's that? Sanctification. And he picked him up on a pinnacle and said, you know the promise of your father. He said, he will not allow you to stumble. Dash your foot against a stone. The angels will carry you up before you fall down. Now, demonstrate that you believe that God will care for you like that. He said, no. I will not tempt God. But show me that you are, a son, you are the son of God. If you do it, even I myself, I will believe. And I'll tell all my messengers that are following after me, go after him, believe him because he's the son of God. If you can only prove it to me. He said, no, I have nothing to prove to you. I'm not wanting to prove anything. I'm not going to do it. I will not tempt my father. How about the people today that are proving they have power? They want to prove before the villagers, before the Muslims, before Satan, before Habalit. And they say, I will prove that this is who I am. You know Jesus? And then he picked him up to the pinnacle and he said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things. All these things I will give unto you if you do something very simple. Just bow down a bit to me and everything will become yours. All the possessions of the world, all the kingdoms of the world and the glories therein. And Jesus looked at everything and it was like dust in his eyes. And he said, Satan, those things are not in my heart. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. They are not important to me. I will not bow down to you. The scripture says, Worship God and only him shalt thou serve. How the devil was surprised that there could be a man on the face of the earth. After not eating for 40 days, 40 days, and has the ability to turn the bread into the stone into bread. How do we know he has the ability? Well, he was at the marriage of the Cana of Galilee. He wasn't hungry, but the people needed it. And he said, now, since there's no selfishness in this one, since I don't need it, they need it, I can do it for them. I can't do it for myself. And he turned the water into wine. He could have turned the bread, the stone, into bread. But he wouldn't do it for himself. And Satan was surprised that there could be somebody born of a woman, somebody having flesh and blood, that he could give all the things that he had, all the tactics he had, he could use, and not get that man to succumb. He knew that something new was going to happen. That's what led to the cross. I'm showing you this to make you understand that the very life of Christ, the very ministry of Christ, 
And all that Christ did, the basis of the whole thing is sanctification and holiness. And then he had seen his own disciples. He called them and was teaching them little by little, little by little. Now he was to go away. He wanted them to grow. And as he called them together, all that he was concerned about again was this holiness and sanctification. First of all, he gave them a picture. After that, he gave them a precept. After that, he gave them a promise. After that, he gave them a prayer. All pointing to, all wanting them to experience sanctification and holiness because he knew without that holiness and sanctification, there will be no growth. And he called them together in chapter 13. And he said they should eat. And in that supper, he told them, this is the bread, my body, that is broken for you. Your body? Broken for us? And while your body is being broken, you are not going to murmur and complain, oh yes, because of sanctification. Tell me. Who can allow himself? Stretch his hand. Knock them with nails. Pin them to the cross. Lift him up. Jerk him down. And get, let all the blood flow without sanctification and submission to God. Somebody can crucify you and you are not sanctified. You will not murmur. They have not even crucified you and see how you have murmured. And brother, is sanctification. And he said, this is my blood. The picture of my blood that is going to, that you are going to drink. It's for you. For the remission of sins of many that believe. Your blood What's the most important thing in man? Apart from the spirit of God. That's your blood. Once the blood is out, your life is gone. You allow all your blood to be drained out. Yes, because, Father, thy will be done. Do you know a man that will suck out all his blood and he will not raise an alarm? And they will say they are sucking out the blood for the life of other people. And they will not trace an alarm without sanctification. I have not discovered one. If you see one, come and show me. After that, he put water in a bowl. And he said, disciples, you are calling me Lord and Master. And so I am. You have called me the right name. But sit down. And then he put the water in the bowl himself put a towel around himself. He knelt down and he began to wash their feet one by one. Can we do that without sanctification? That's the picture. He wanted them to understand that before they could do the work he was handing over for them to do, there is one important thing that must happen in their lives. And he will show them first. And that is sanctification. And he humbled himself. When he came to Peter, it was too much for Peter. And Peter said, Lord, you wash my feet. I will not allow you. He said, if I don't wash your feet, you always want to have your way. The lesson I want to teach you, you don't want to learn it. If I don't wash you, I reject you. And Peter said, Lord, not my feet alone, but my head, my hands, every part of me said, no. I'm only teaching you a lesson. I'm not bathing you. I am cleansing you. I'm showing you a lesson that you will see that I am willing on your behalf to go down completely, subject myself, humble myself, that this lesson of sanctification I'm trying to pass across you have not got, that's what I'm at. And then he began to tell them that somebody will betray me. Somebody will betray me. Because they will be taken by wicked hands, nailed to the cross. And one of you 
my friends, my disciples, one of you will betray me. Who is it, Lord? Is it I? Is it I? No. The person I will take food, not poison, not hammer. The person I will take food and put it in his mouth and feed him. That's the one that will betray me. If you are not 25, what will you tell them? The person I knock on the head, that's the one that will betray me. But no, the person I feed. The person I feed. I will take that soap, I'll put in his mouth. I'm willing to feed him. I know he's going to betray me. I know through him I'm going to suffer. But this sanctification, I will show it until the very last time on the cross. I'll still give him food. You see that? No wonder Jesus did all that he did. And eventually, he began to tell them that they will have to receive the Holy Spirit, but they will wait in Jerusalem. They will wait for some days. What will they be doing? Preaching? No. Just self-examination and prayer and preparation. Why? Because all through those days they will need to come face to face with their inner selfishness. Dig everything out. Dig everything out. Before the day of Pentecost will come, all in preparation that the power will come upon them. Then eventually he came to the last bit of it. John chapter 17. One, he had shown them the picture. Lowering himself. Humbling himself. Washing their feet. He had given them precepts. He had given them illustration. He had shown them by his life. And now he left them alone and he talked to the father and he said, Father, there's something I want for my disciples before I leave. I want them to get this. I know it by personal experience because, listen to me, you cannot give out what you do not have. That's why all the preachers that are saying no sanctification, they won't discover their sanctification. They can't give out what they don't have. They're saying it's not possible to be holy. We understand them. In their lives since they were preachers, they have not discovered the possibility they know they exaggerate. They know they lie. They know they cheat. They know they steal. They know that they get angry. They know that they are bitter. They know it's difficult for them to forgive. They know it's impossible for them to be holy. So, what will they preach? The impossibility. But Jesus Christ, having shown it from right from his birth through to the cross, he said, now, because I have it, I'm going to pray for these disciples. And he began to pray for them one by one. And he said, Lord, this is special prayer. I am not praying for the world, for the sinners in the world. I'm praying for these, my disciples, whom you have given to me. Already they are saved. Look at John 17, verse 3. And there is his life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The question is, did they know that God? You better believe they knew him. Because Jesus asked them a question. Who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you are. Elijah, some say you are Isa, some say you are Jeremiah, some say you are one of the prophets. And he said, who do you say that I am? Oh, one of them said, we know you. You are Christ, the son of the living God. What's eternal life? This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and know me, whom you have sent. And Peter said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. What does that mean? They are eternal life. Because this is life eternal, that they will know you, 
God in heaven and Christ whom you have sent. And because they knew him, he asked Philip, Philip, have I been so long with you and have you not known me? Of course, they knew him. They had eternal life. They were born again. But even though they were born again, he knew that the born again experience alone was not enough. They must go ahead and be sanctified so that the work he was giving them to do, they will be able to do successfully. Now look at verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee. Before the world was, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me, and they have kept thy word. They were born again. They have kept your word. You have given them to me. Out of the world was church, is ecclesia. Was ecclesia, those who are called out of the world, and they are now in Christ. So they were born again called out of the world. And Jesus said, they have kept thy word. You remember that Bible passage? Thy word have I hid or kept in my heart that I might not do what? That I might not sin against you. They were born again. There were no more sinners. They have kept thy word. In verse 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. They have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me, as many as received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God, even as many as believed on his name. They received, they believed. Who were they? They were children of God. Sons of God. Because they received Christ as the Son of God. They believed on him as the Son of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's what they did. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they received all his word. Now there are people that tell us that sanctification is for unbelievers. That believers are already sanctified long, long ago. We don't need to pray for it. But look at Jesus' own disciples. That these disciples were first born again. Children of God washed in the blood, cleansed by his word, and they had received him, received Christ. When you are talking and you say, these people, they are of the world, they cannot receive the spirit of truth because they do not know him, neither do they see him. And you say, but when you say but, you are going to talk about some people that are different. That's the meaning of but. Do you follow? Are you following what I'm saying? Then Jesus said, but, verse 17, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Oh yes, they were born again. How can we say that the Spirit of God dwelleth with sinners? Unbelievers. But Jesus said, Disciples, the world cannot know the Spirit of God. They cannot receive because they neither know Him nor see Him. But in your own case, because you have been reconciled unto God through Jesus Christ, because your sins are taken away, because you are children of the Almighty God, you know Him. You know Him. Because he dwelleth with you. But then he says, in that verse 17, and in the future, not many days after this, he shall be in you. That's how we know they were born again. 
and after they had been born again, after they had been children of God. Now Jesus was praying for them, and this was a special prayer. Special prayer. Listen to me. When Jesus prayed for the sick, he did it on the street. When Jesus cleansed the lepers, he did it right outside there with a mixture of both unbelievers and believers there. When Jesus raised the dead, he brought in three disciples and the parents of the child he wanted to raise. Mixture. Believers and unbelievers. When Jesus raised the, uh, the child of that widow right on the street, all the unbelievers were there. When he wanted to pray the special prayer, he locked the door. All the unbelievers were outside. Why? Because it's not meant for them. Only believers. Only disciples. Even Judas Iscariot had been sent out. Because after he received the sob, the devil came into him. And now these were just believers. Close down with him. Not unbelievers and believers. Not sinners and saints. Not all the mixed multitude together. But just the believers that have received your word. And the people that he has called out of the world. He said, Father, I pray for them. Oh yes, a special prayer. People say, you talk about sanctification. Oh yes. You pray about sanctification. Oh yes, where? Among the believers. We lock out the unbelievers. Those who say, I don't believe in holiness, we lock them out. Those who say, I don't believe God has enough power to purify the heart of man, we lock them out before we pray. Those who say, I don't believe that one can live above sin, we lock them out. Because when Jesus wanted to pray for the sanctification of all these believers, he locked out the unbelievers and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, disciples, dress nearer here. Don't, don't, don't go far away. We are praying special prayer. Not for sickness, not for healing, not for cleansing leper. Draw nearer here. Judas is gone. Forget about him now. And let's pray this prayer. And he called to the Father and said, Father, I pray for them. I pray for them. Inside. I'd like to be in that meeting. Where the believers are together. And we know we are saved. We know we are born again. We know we are children of God. And we're saying, Father, now this is a special prayer. Not Friday. Miracle Revival Hour for everybody, sinners, Catholics, Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, Deeper, everyone come in, receive miracle. Not that one. Not mixed multitude. I want job. I want bread. I want money. I want car. I want prosperity. I want healing. Not that one. Special prayer. Believers alone. And he called them together and said, Father, I pray for them. If you had been there, Jesus prayed like he never prayed before. You know, even when he was going to raise up Lazarus, all the people that came to mourn, they were at the graveside. But this one, special. People say, sanctification is specially for deeper life people. Thank God it is. Thank God it is. Thank God it is. Yes. Jesus only is our message. Jesus all in all will sing. Savior, sanctifier, healer, baptizer, and the coming king. Jesus is our sanctifier. All our sin he bore away. And with the Spirit's fullness... He comes to dwell. He fills our hearts within. Jesus only. Jesus ever. Savior. Sanctifier. Healer. Baptizer. And the coming King. And in verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me. And what's the prayer? 
Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Rise up and let us pray. Almighty God and Holy Father, we come before you. Like Isaiah came before you, showing the need that he needed a purifying, a cleansing, and a purging. And immediately, because you saw the sincerity, because you saw the real desire, because you know that you really meant to be pure and to be clean before you, you sent your angel to take the fire out of the altar to touch him. And you touched him immediately. In the same way, O oh Lord, tonight we have come to you not satisfied with any dirt, with any stain, with self, with anything that has blocked the way for a long time. Lord, we come. We know that this is the basis of our growth. And we come because we know you can do it. Paul the Apostle prayed for the Thessalonians and said, The God of all peace, sanctify them holy. It's your work. We cannot do it by ourselves. You are still doing it today. And one of the apostles mentioned and said that he purified the hearts of those Gentiles by faith. The moment we believe, we know you can do it. We come to you in faith tonight. Believing that no matter the depravity, no matter the inward inability, no matter the stain of the original sin, no matter how dead and cold that we have been, your fire can burn every chaff. So we're asking that fire from the altar of heaven. Fire coming right from your presence. With the blood of Jesus, the purifying, sanctifying blood of Jesus will be applied to every one of our hearts. And right now we pray that those invisible hands of yours will apply that blood in our inner man, in our conscience, in our heart, in our spirit. Amen. Deep, deep to our private lives so cleanse everything in Jesus' name. Amen. How can we come away from your presence and remain dirty? Remain unsanctified. Remain unholy. Lord, holy God, we are praying that you apply the blood of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, upon every willing heart, every desirous heart, everyone that is seeking and asking, say, Lord, this is what we want and this is what we need. Sanctify in Jesus' name. Touch our thought lives. Those wandering hearts and wandering thoughts arrest by your power in Jesus' name. Give us the mind of Christ. The very image in the heart of Christ. Lord, we're asking tonight that you give us that same image in Jesus' name. Lord, as deeper life, people, we have been too near the world. We have been too near other believers. Impossibility thinking believers. Unbelieving believers. Church going believers. Believers that lack in zeal. Believers that lack in truth. Their books have confused us. Their actions have influenced us. Their language has affected us. But Lord, your colors, 
by special calling. And here we come. We realize our need. You made us peculiar. We have made ourselves ordinary. You call us as a treasure. We have made ourselves as a wooden instrument. You called us to be spotless and clean and holy and pure. We have rubbed shoulders with talkatives, with church members, with other people that do not know of the power in the blood of Jesus to cleanse. And unfortunately, we joke like them, we talk like them, we act like them, we move with them. Our unity has not been with the people of the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ. Our unity has been with the people that are backsliding, people that are drawing back, people that are forsaking you, people that are lukewarm, people that are not zealous, people that are not watching on and watching their lives. In the name of unity, our iron has become blunt. In the name of unity, our hearts have been defiled. In the name of unity, we are forsaking the treasure that we have planted in our hearts. But Lord, we come back. And like I said, we say we are undone. But we are men of unclean lips. And we dwell in the midst of people unclean. But Lord, if you can give us this chance and bring that coal of fire and purge our hearts and bring that blood of Jesus and purify our hearts and make us different. Make us different. Father, we pray that the only example we see will be the example of Jesus. British Christians, American Christians, Indian Christians, Japanese Christians, Korean Christians, African Christians, they have their own lifestyle. But we're not looking at anybody as an example. Jesus, you said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Father, you give us that apostle, apostle to the Gentiles. And he wrote to us to follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Lord, we will not forget. We cannot forget. That when David looked up and he asked you, Lord, Father God in heaven, who shall abide in thy holy tabernacle? You answered from heaven. He that has clean hands, and a pure heart. And Lord, as you have called us and you are holy, so have you commanded us to be holy in all manner of conversation. We come today. Do it in us. Purify us. Sanctify us. Make a definite change in our lives in Jesus' name. Father, we remember some other people that were preached the same holiness sanctification before. 
And you told us at that time that when we become sanctified, we shall all be one. We'll not be divided. We'll not be separated. We'll not be pulling apart. We'll not be raising up an empire for self. But some of us who say we have been sanctified, we have become disunited with your body. Pulled away. Building up personal empire. Lord, your will is sanctification. Your will is unity. For those who are here today, who remember that this is the greatest thing in your heart, sanctify us. Anything of the depravity or the stain of the original sin, by your mighty hand, eradicate them out of our hearts in Jesus' name. Unbelieving church goers, they say it is not possible. But we say, with God, all things are possible. We believe you. We accept it. We believe you have answered us. Keep us with this experience. In the day, in the night, among the brethren, outside the church, wherever we find ourselves, remind us that we are peculiar. Remind us that we are different. Remind us that you have cleansed us. Remind us that we are peculiar treasures before you. Remind us that the garments are white. I will not go to soil that garment once again. Lord, the world is becoming worse and worse. Rumors of war in the world and in the church. In the schools and in the church, pride outside and inside. The world is decaying, the world is becoming more corrupt. The joke, even Pentecostal people, charismatic people, evangelical people, those who say they are born again. The jokes, the dirty jokes they tell. The dirty places they go. The dirty pictures they see. And the dirty things they watch on television. Lord, these are these last days. And you have called us out of the world. Out of sin. Out of self. And here we are today saying, Lord, the world is ever near. Jesus, draw thou nearer. You kept Enoch pure and clean. Oh yes, he lost many friends because he walked with God. They said he was too holy for them. He was too pure for them. He was too heavenly minded for them. They ran away from him. Oh, Father. Like Enoch of old, you raptured him away. Amen. And we're waiting for the rapture. Amen. We're waiting for the call, for the trumpet sound. We want to walk with you until that day pure and clean, holy and righteous, heavenly minded, not having the mind of the world, but just walking with you, crucifying the flesh, living in righteousness, not giving heed to seducing spirits of these last days. Father, there are many books that are coming in the market, in the bookshops, 
And they are telling us not to worry about holiness. They are telling us all we need to do is just to speak in tongues. They are telling us all we need is just to get healing. They are telling us all we need is just intercessory prayer. They are telling us holiness should be thrown away. Forgotten. And yet we are coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, holy and without blemish. Lord, count us as part of the number. The number that will see you on that day. The number that will know when you come on that day. And without holiness, no man shall see you. The world is proud because of their degrees. The world is proud because they say they are reverend, they are bishop, they are apostle. They think that is the title that matters. And yet, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The world is asking for a revival, but only a revival of miracles. Revival of healing. Revival of casting out devils. They are not asking for the revival of holiness. But Lord, we will be different. This church, deeper like Bible church, you have raised up yourself by your power. Lord, we will be different. They will abuse us. That's how they abuse Noah. The man that found grace in the sight of the Lord. And he obeyed God. And he feared God. And he walked with God. That's how they abused old Abraham. They called him foolish. That's how Ophni and Phinehas ridiculed and made jest of Samuel. He will not commit sin. He will be different. And Jesus said, if they have done that to me, they will do it to you. Lord, I miss all the abuse of the people of this world. Calling us, holy, holy, mother of Jesus. Calling us Puritan. Calling us Moravians. Whatever names they call us, make us different. Amen. Keep us different. Amen. That Lord, on that day, on that day, when the saints of God shall go marching in, on that day, when the trumpet shall sound, on that day, when nothing will matter, when many will say, Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out many devils in your name? Have we not done many mighty works in your name? And you will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. On that day, when it will not matter, those who have gone to seminary or college, on that day, when it will not matter, those who have ridden, those who have had cars or aeroplane, on that day, when it will not matter how much money that we had, on that day, when it will not matter what degrees we had, what titles we are called, on that day, when it will not matter, whether we have gone to London or gone to America or gone to Japan. But the only thing that will matter is that that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Count us worthy. Make us worthy. Lord, we pray that until that time, our garments will not be dirty. Lord, help us not to run after these people of the world that are bragging. They have gone here, they have gone there, they have gone there, they have gone there. Help us to look away from them. To look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hold our hand, Lord. We know the time is short. We know you are soon coming back. The world is calling us to come back. The devil is beckoning on us to come back. Our old friends are asking us 
Don't you feel lonely in holiness? Don't you feel lonely? You don't have many friends. They are calling us to come back. But Lord, we are waiting for you. Lord, we are waiting for you. And we know that judgment will begin at the house of God. But when that fire of judgment begins to burn, when you burn the works of all the people that are proud and unsanctified, and all their work of stubble and hay will be burnt away, and they will be saved to us by fire. When all those empires will crumble, when all those names and titles will mean nothing, and they would have gone away in the judgment of fire, Lord will pray that on that day, we will stand and not fall. Preserve us. It will not be long again. Suddenly, you are coming back. Suddenly, Lord, you are coming back. Help us to keep our treasure in heaven. Keep us. Lord, keep us. Lord, keep us. Lord, keep us. The feet of the young people are slipping and they are going away because of the flesh, because of marriage, because of money, because of popularity. And oh Lord, we we'll say you keep us in Jesus' name. Make us stable. This holiness, Enoch lived it and preached it and stood on it for 300 years. Samuel stood on it from the time he was very young until he was old. And Paul the apostle from the very day you called him. When he waited on you and fasted for three days and will not allow anything to enter his mouth. Just saying, Lord, I surrender all. All the three days, just saying, Lord, I surrender all. He got up out of this, out of that place. And until he died, he said, I've finished my work. I've run the race. Right now, a crown of righteousness is laid up for me. Lord, like those patriarchs of old, like those preachers of old, like those workers of old, keep us faithful. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king called them. If you will change, if you will bend, if you will bow, no problem. But if you refuse to bow, look at the fire, look at the furnace. Heated seven times hot, I'll throw you in. Oh God, give us the spirit of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That will be able to look at the king in the face and say, What we have got, we have got. What we have preached, we have preached. What we have said, we have said. What we are standing on, we are standing on. And we don't care for the fire. We don't care for the persecution. We don't care for the problem. And he threw them in. They fell down. And the ropes were burnt. And they rose up. And the Son of God came to them. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Did not we cast three men into the fire? Behold, four men. They have no hurt. Lord, we know when our hearts are pure, nothing can hurt us. The fires of the world cannot hurt us. The persecutions of the world cannot hurt us. The jesting of the world cannot hurt us. Make us faithful and keep on to this holiness until the end in Jesus' name. And he called them out of the front and said, Ye servants of the living God, make us your servants. Make us submit unto you. Lord, we pray until 
we lay our sword down. Keep us faithful to the end. Keep us holy unto the end. This prayer that you have answered today, this experience you have given us today, this hand of God that has touched our heart today, this purifying fire that has purified our heart today, we pray it will never cease in Jesus.